Well, hey, what is up? Uh, if we've never met before, my name is Taylor Hunt, and I live over in Ventura. Get to work at Mission Church with middle school and high school students there. Uh, and man, I'm so glad to be back here at Cal Church. And we're continuing in a two-week series that we've been in, where we're kind of binge-watching through the story of Jonah. And Jonah is a book in the Old Testament part of your Bible. It is only four chapters, 48 short verses. And man, this is like a great show to watch. If they ever made it into a show one day, this would be amazing. And there are a couple of things that great shows all have in common. You know, they've got some great writing, they've got great actors, they have great plot, twist turns, and all those types of things. And all great shows also have a great theme song. Um, see if you can name and guess which so show some of these theme songs came from. Uh, like this one. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. You know what that one is? It's Cheers. Go ahead. If you know which one, what theme song it is, you can go ahead and type it in the chat. Uh, or what about this theme song? Um, do, 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 do. you know what that one is? That is The Office. Uh, or how about, so no one told you life was gonna be this way. <laughs> Friends, did you get that one right? Uh, and then here we go. One of our last ones. What about this one? My family and I, we loved this show. But the theme song goes like this. Whatever happened to predictability, the milkman, the paperboy, even in TV, you miss your old familiar friends waiting just around the bend. I know my singing probably gave it away, uh, but that one is Full House. Uh, but one of my favorite theme songs of all time goes like this. <clears throat> Now this is a story all about how my life got flipped, turned upside down. And I'd like to take a minute, just tell you the tale, or just sit right there, tell you how I became the prince of a town called Bel Air. Do you know what show that's from? The Fresh Prince of Bel Air. And so I thought today, uh, as we were kind of jumping back into our story of Jonah, as we're jumping into episode three of our series, it would just be good to start off with a little bit of a theme song and a little bit of a recap. So don't hold this against me. But this is the story all about how my life got flipped, turned upside down. And I'd like to take a minute, just tell you the tale all about how I got swallowed by a whale. In West Israel, born and raised in the desert is where I spent most of my days. Chilling out, maxing, relaxing, all cool and all hating some Ninevites because they are fools. When after a couple of days, God came up to me. Nineveh was getting whack in the country. So God said it was my turn to try. And I said, huh, I think I'd rather die. So I went down to Joppa, boarded a ship, headed for Tarshish because I don't give a rip. When all of a sudden a storm came after me, tossing and turning, will I make it free? But wait one second, what do you know? I'm getting tossed off the side with the cargo. And as I sank down and I started to drown, I thought, this is it. It's the end of my tale. And then all of a sudden, I got swallowed by a whale. And tossing and turning inside the belly, my oh my, did I feel like jetty, jelly. When I finally said, okay, God, I'll go. He said, that's right, you already know this whale will take you all the way there. And that's how I got to preach to Nineveh. And so welcome to episode three of our series on the book of Jonah. And episode three is titled Last Chance University. I mean, have you guys ever seen this show? You know, it follows this football team in East Mississippi Community College. And this team specializes in giving players that maybe have messed up, made some mistakes, been in trouble with drugs or the law, like this team gives them a second chance. And man, I think we all love second chances, don't we? I mean, we all love a redemption story. And what we're going to see today in episode three of Jonah's story is that, man, we serve a God that is a God of second chances. Uh, have any of you ever been around a little kid whenever they throw a tantrum? You know, say the parent says, it's time to go to bed, and the little kid decides that they don't want to. I mean, what do they do? They run in the opposite direction. You know, sometimes they will throw just a rip-roaring fit. They'll throw their bodies on the ground. They will yell and scream and cry. And whenever these little master manipulators, like, try to persuade the parents to do something else, what normally happens? I mean, do they actually accomplish what they're trying to do? I mean, do their parents go, you know what? You've made some good points. Whenever you were yelling at me, I've actually decided it is not time to go to bed. No! I mean, wise parents don't give in. They will be gentle, but also firm. They might send the kid to time out. They'll say, okay, two things. First of all, you need to learn you cannot throw a fit and run away. And second thing, it's still time to go to bed. And right here in episode three of our story, we have our heavenly father, after he has ordered the fish to barf Jonah out on the beach saying, all right, Jonah, two things. Now that you're out of time out, 
First thing, you need to learn you cannot throw a fit and run away. Second thing, it's still time to go to Nineveh. Check out what it says. It says, This time Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh, a city so large that it took three days to see it all. Now, Nineveh is part of modern-day Mosul, uh, but in Jonah's day, this city was one of the biggest, most impressive cities in the entire world. Like, its palace alone was the size of three city blocks. It had hallways that were 40 feet wide, 180 feet long, that led to the interior of the palace. I mean, you maybe have seen some impressive houses, you know, on MTV Cribs or Extreme Makeover Home Edition, but they've got nothing on the palace in Nineveh. And if that wasn't enough, the city had enormous walls with heavily fortified gates that surrounded 1,700 acres of the city. It was large, it was wealthy, it was wild, it was colorful, and it had a total disregard for anything godly. And so again, I mean, you can imagine being Jonah, this flag-waving patriot from the neighboring nation of Israel. He is now in the capital of his most feared enemy, and it stood for everything that Jonah hated. And don't forget Nineveh, you know, it was this wicked and wild city. Back in the day, they would have said what happens in Nineveh stays in Nineveh. These guys were prideful, arrogant, and cruel. When they conquered a surrounding city, they would cut off the heads of the men and they would put them in a pyramid outside of the city that they had just conquered. I mean, they had the flagrant in-your-face kind of sins. This was some wicked dudes, some wicked people in a big, wicked city. And so there is probably a little satisfaction in Jonah's pronouncement of judgment on these people. I mean, he wanted God to drop the hammer on them. So this time he goes thinking, all right, God, I'll do it because you say so. But they're probably going to stone me, burn me, kill me, you know, just beat me, do whatever to me. And so with a not great attitude, Jonah entered the city and he shouted to the crowds, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. Now this was the message that God had given him. And these words were powerful because they were God's words. And I think we're all turned off by those fire and brimstone preachers, you know, that say, turn or burn. I mean, have you ever had a preacher, ever heard someone from a stage or in a pulpit, you know, yell at you like you were going to hell and it kind of seemed like they were glad about it? I mean, I think we're all turned off by people like that. But this word turn, man, it's been abused over the years by less than loving preachers, by less than loving Christians. But sometimes, man, we really do need to hear somebody say, come on, man, you got to turn around before it's too late. Come on, it's just time to repent. You know the basic meaning of the word repentance? It's actually a military term that means to take an about face. Or maybe this will help us. It's kind of like a U-turn. You know, if you've ever seen a U-turn sign before, it's like making a changing of our life, going in a new direction, changing 180 degrees to do an about face on our old way of living and walk in a new direction to walk wholeheartedly toward our loving Father. And man, sometimes we think that God wants people to repent for him. You know, it's like we think that he's some sort of cosmic control freak, you know, and he feels good whenever people follow his plans and his ways, whenever everybody in the world is walking towards him. Like only when God is in control, that's when he's happy. But no, did you know that the Bible actually says it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance? I mean, the truth is we're all blinded by this thing that we talked about last week called sin. And if we aren't careful, our sin will hurt us in other people. And when God comes along and he calls us to repent, to do an about face, to live a different way, it's not because he's angry or controlling or mean. No, it's because of his kindness. I mean, check out what it says in Romans 2. It says, in his kindness, he takes us firmly by the hand and leads us into a radical life change. Well, guess what happens in Jonah's story? Man, these not so good, wicked, pagan outcasts, they don't kill him or burn him or stone him. They don't even laugh at him for smelling like three day old sardines. I mean, they don't even laugh at him for smelling whaley bad. I'm sorry, that's a bad dad joke. Instead, these guys, man, they believe God. These Ninevites, they humble themselves. They change direction. And as a sincere sign of sorrow over their sins, over all the evil that they have done, they put on sackcloth and ashes, an outward sign of inward grieving. And man, they repent. They do an about face. You know, the king of the Ninevites um, and his nobles, he sent this decree throughout the city. He said, no one, not even the animals from your herds and flocks may eat or drink anything at all. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning and everyone must pray earnestly to God. They must turn from their evil ways and stop all their violence. Who can tell? 
Perhaps even yet, God will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. Man, they reason, maybe if we change our ways, then God will change his mind. And man, you know God loves all kind of people. And he responds to humble ones. And I found that real freedom in my life is found in brokenness. I mean, when I get to that sackcloth and ashes stage where I humbly say, God, I don't want to live like this anymore. I want to change. I want to get well. I want to live a different kind of way. I'm sorry for the way I've been running in the opposite direction from you. God, I'm sorry for the damage I've done to myself, the damage that I've done to others. I'm tired of leading my own life. I'm tired of calling the shots. I want to do life your way. Like when we get to that point and we feel broken and we surrender, when we humble ourselves, Man, God will lift us up. See, true repentance, it always results in a surrender to God's leadership and a resolve to walk a new direction, a new way with his help. See, in Jonah's story, it says, when God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to all their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction that he had threatened. See, man, God is the God of second chances. God is the God of third and fourth and fifth chances. He's the God of unfailing love and amazing grace. And I'm telling you, it is never too late to make some changes in our life, to do a U-turn, to walk a new way, to walk a new direction. It is God's kindness that leads us to repentance. And man, so the question for us is what about us? I mean, is there anything that we've been running to that we need to repent of? Is there anything that we've been trying to hide, that we've been trying to keep from God, that we've been trying to act like it's not actually happening, that we've been trying to fake it till we make it? Is there anything that we just need to surrender over to him? And man, maybe you've always thought that God was this maniacal control freak trying to get you to follow all of his rules, follow all of his ways. But man, what would it change if you knew that it wasn't God's controlling, if it wasn't God's anger, if it wasn't God's, you know, frustration, but it was actually God's kindness in character, his amazing grace, his unfailing love, that leads us to repentance. Man, that would change everything. And that's the end of episode three. And so now we enter into our final episode, episode four, Offended by Grace. Have you ever been offended by grace? You know, whenever we start following God, it's easy to be amazed by grace. You know, I've heard it said that grace is getting what we don't deserve. And man, when we've been set free from the penalty of our sin, when we've been rescued and redeemed, when we're set free from our belly of a whale moment, it is easy to be amazed by grace. You know, when we walk around singing, you know, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But man, if we aren't careful, we'll start off amazed by grace. And it's easy to kind of end up after a couple days, a couple weeks, a couple months, a couple years of being around church, a couple years about hearing about the story of Jesus, where we can end up becoming apathetic to grace. And we'll be like, oh yeah, grace. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt, snapped the pic. I mean, what's next? I mean, yeah, grace. It was, yeah, it's super great, super decent. But come on, there's got to be something more to it. And then if we aren't careful, we'll start off amazed by grace. We'll slowly become apathetic to grace. But then we can actually become offended by grace. We can become angry when we see God's grace extended to others. I mean, have you ever been a little frustrated whenever you've heard about the 11th hour conversion of somebody? Have you ever been upset whenever a well-known celebrity suddenly claims that they've seen the light and they've turned their life around and converted and they're now following after Jesus? You know, maybe somebody like Kanye West, Justin Bieber, Ted Bundy. Do you get a pit in your belly whenever you think about those guys turning their life around, doing a U-turn? Do you think, man, that's just not fair after all they've done? I mean, have you ever felt frustrated that you've been trying to live a God-honoring life for so long, and then when it comes down to it, somebody else can turn their life over to God at the last second, you know, in the fourth quarter, they can be in the hospital bed and they get the same end result? I mean, that's just not fair. Have you ever been a little bit jealous 
that somebody could live a wild and rebellious life. They could do whatever they wanted to do. They didn't even have to have any concern. It could be carefree for God and his ways. And it just made you a little bit bitter. Man, have you ever been offended by grace? You know, I bet if we're honest with ourselves, if I'm honest with myself, man, we've all been a little bit offended by grace. I mean, how could a guy, God, love a guy that had done that? How could God save that girl? I mean, those people are just too much. Do you know what he was doing last weekend? Do you know that she identifies with that group of people? I mean, they say they believe, but their behavior doesn't line up. Like, God, how could you love somebody from that party who voted that way, who makes those decisions? That's a part of that group that shows up in those places. I mean, God, that just doesn't seem fair, does it? I mean, check out how Jonah himself a recent recipient of God's grace, responds when God decides to spare the Ninevites. It says in Jonah 4 verse 1, it says, This change of plans greatly upset Jonah, and he became very angry. Now, have you ever seen a toddler uh, throw a temper tantrum and you just couldn't help but laugh at it? You know, maybe, you know, they said something sassy. Maybe they just had this ridiculous look on their face. You know, they did a weird thing with their lip. But you just could not help but laugh. And man, when we read the way that Jonah reacts, I just can't help but think of Jonah as like this big old toddler as he throws one whale of a temper tantrum. I mean, check it out. It says, so Jonah complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? I mean, that is why. Why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you were a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. I mean, God, you were eager to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I had predicted will not happen. I mean, dramatic much? The Oscar for Best Actor goes to Jonah. I mean, he is either a toddler or a teenager with sass like this. I mean, has this guy forgotten that just a few days ago, he was drowning in the middle of the ocean when he was a recipient of God's grace? I mean, this guy was belting out songs of praise in the belly of a whale. He probably still smells like whale barf. This prophet of God was a recent recipient of grace, and now he's offended by God's grace being extended to somebody else. I mean, Jonah just isn't offended. He is ticked off by grace. That is not fair, God. And you know, Jonah kind of reminds me of this older brother in a story, a parable that Jesus told in Luke 15 about two brothers. So one day this younger brother comes to their father and says, Father, give me my share of the inheritance now. You know, he's like Spanky from Alfalfa. Dear Darla, I hate your stinking guts. You make me vomit. You're the scum between my toes. Love, Alfalfa. I mean, this brother basically says to his dad, Dad, you're worth more to me dead than alive. So I wish you were dead. I hate your stinking guts. You make me vomit. You're the scum between my toes. Love, you're a kind younger son. And for whatever reason, this father decides to split the estate and gives the younger son his share of the inheritance. So the younger son heads off to the Las Vegas of the day and he spends the money on wine, women, and gambling. He spent everything he had and then he gets totally bankrupt. And then a famine hits the land and now this younger son is working on a pig farm. And so one day he is looking longingly at the food that the pigs are eating and he occurs to himself, Man, don't my father's servants eat better than this? I'll go home and surely my dad won't take me back as a son, but he'll take me back as a servant. So the younger brother heads home and he gets this speech played up in his mind. And the older, or the father one evening is sitting out on his front porch in his rocking chair, sipping on some sweet tea, when all of a sudden he sees his younger son on the horizon. And it says he was filled with compassion. So he leapt out of his chair, clambered down the steps, sprinted down the driveway to his son. The father threw his arms around his son, began kissing him when the son started into his speech. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father called out to his servants, bring the best robe, put it on my son, put a ring on his finger, kill the fattened calf because it is time to party. This son of mine that was lost, but now is found. But meanwhile, the older brother was out in a field and whenever he got closer to the house, he saw the party, heard the dancing and figured out that the father was throwing a party for his younger brother. And he thought, man, that just isn't fair. And so the older brother became angry. He refused to go in. He is ticked off by the grace that his father is showing. So the father goes out to the older son, and this older son pleads with him. He says to the father, all these years I've been slaving away. I've never disobeyed, never left, never did anything wrong, and yet you never even gave me a small party. But when this son of yours comes home from blowing his cash at the casinos, you killed the fattened calf for him. I mean, that is just not fair. 
Like this older brother is ticked off by grace. He's offended by the grace of the Father. You know, Jonah also reminds me of some workers in another story that Jesus told one time in Matthew 20 about a guy who owned a vineyard and went out early in the morning around 6 a.m. to hire some workers to work in his vineyard. And so they, these guys agree on a wage of about $50. And so these workers head out to the vineyard and go to work for the day. Well, the owner went back out and he hired more guys at 9 a.m. and noon because they had a lot of work to do. Uh, so the guys were working through the day. He goes back out at 3 p.m., hires a few more guys, go back out at 5 p.m., sees some dudes standing around, and so he invites them to come work in his vineyard and he'll pay them. Well, when it came quitting time around 7 p.m., the owner ordered the foreman to go ahead and pay the workers, starting with the guys who were hired last and ending with the guys who were hired first. So the guys who started working at 5 p.m. walk up to the foreman and to their surprise, a $50 bill gets slapped right in their hand. So whenever the guys who started working at 6 a.m. finally get up to the line, they've seen everyone get paid $50, and they are excited. They expect to receive even more. But sure enough, the foreman slapped a $50 bill in their hand as well. And man, these guys are ticked. They start to grumble under their breath about the vineyard owner. These guys only worked for two hours, and they got equal pay to us who were working all day. I mean, that just isn't fair. They are ticked off by grace. They are offended by grace. They cannot believe what has just happened. And you know, Jonah not only reminds me of this older brother, not only reminds me of these vineyard workers, but you know who else Jonah kind of reminds me of? Man, Jonah reminds me of me when I'm at my worst. And man, maybe, just maybe, if we're honest, maybe we can admit that we can see ourselves in Jonah as well. I mean, have you ever been offended by grace? I mean, what I'm learning is that if I'm not careful, I can start to think that I deserve grace, that I've earned God's grace. I can start to think that God owes me something because I've been obedient. That, you know, yeah, I know all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But look how far they've fallen. I mean, when we are not careful, man, this comparative, judgmental spirit, man, it can start to slip in. You know, an author named Richard Lovelace, he says, people who are no longer sure that God loves and accepts them in Jesus, apart from their present spiritual achievements, are subconsciously radically insecure persons. Their insecurity shows itself in pride, a fierce defensive assertion of their own righteousness, and defensive criticism of others. Uh, Timothy Keller, another author, he wrote a great book called The Prodigal God, which looks in depth at the story of those two brothers. But in it, he writes, that his, the elder brother's spiritual problem is the radical insecurity that comes from basing his self-image on achievements and performance. So he must endlessly prop up his sense of righteousness by putting others down and finding fault. As one of my teachers in seminary put it, the main barrier between Pharisees, by the religious rulers, by these people that put their value in religious achievements instead of God's grace, the main barrier between Pharisees and God is not their sins, but they're damnable good works. Man, I heard somebody say it one time that if Satan can't get you to disobey, he'll get you to obey for all the wrong reasons. And if we aren't careful, man, this critical, judgmental spirit, this getting ticked off at God's grace, this thinking that God owes us something, man, it is one of the biggest barriers that can keep followers of Jesus, that can keep the church from making a difference in the world. I mean, if we have not fully grasped the gospel deeply, the truth that we are more broken than we'll ever know, more loved than we can ever imagine, the truth that God sent his one and only son to die for us when we were at our worst, when all of us were at our worst, if we do not grasp the gospel, man, we will return to being condescending, condemning, anxious and insecure, joyless and angry all the time. And man, that's why I just hope that we never stop being amazed by God's grace. Because man, his grace really is amazing. You know, God's grace isn't just a one and done kind of thing. It's a daily dose kind of thing where every day we wake up and we realize just how much we need God's grace. You know, grace is not only the smelling salt that wakes us up to our own brokenness, but it is the fuel that keeps us moving forward. Every day, man, his grace is new. His mercies are new. And every day, man, we need to be amazed by God's grace. You know, I love that jo God's response to Jonah after he throws this toddler-sized temper tantrum. 
It says, the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? Jonah, are you really mad that I'm showing grace? You know, and then Jonah's story ends in kind of a funny way. Jonah goes up on a mountainside that overlooks Nineveh, and he's hoping that God will still rain down some fire, and he'll get to watch everything burn. And so while he is sitting there up on this mountainside, God makes a big old plant grow up to give Jonah some shade. And it says that this eased Jonah's discomfort, and he was very grateful for the plant. But the next day, uh, God arranged for a worm to eat the plant, and it died. And so now Jonah is sitting in the heat of the day up on this mountainside when a scorching east wind whips by and begins to blow in Jonah's face, and he begins to grow faint to the point where he wished to die. Death is certainly better than living like this, Jonah exclaimed. And then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes, Jonah retorted, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. I mean, shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? And that ends episode four of Jonah's story. And this is actually where our script runs out, like right in a cliffhanger. I mean, I don't know if this show just didn't get renewed for a fifth season, for a fifth episode. Um, Maybe the writer just ran out of ink, but that's where it ends, right there. But man, here is the big point of Jonah's story that we've seen over and over again. It's that God's grace is for everyone. Jonah's story lets us know that God's grace is for everyone. I mean, it doesn't, mean if, it doesn't matter if you were born in a pew or if you are brand new. It doesn't matter if you, can, if you can't even count the number of Bible verses that you have lodged in your head or if you can't count the number of needles you've stuck in your arm. Like, we all need grace. Older brothers and younger brothers, prophets like Jonah, punks like the Ninevites, pastors and prostitutes, doctors and druggies, we're all in need of God's grace. And man, when we notice a subtle shift under the surface, when we start to get angry at grace, offended by grace instead of amazed by it, man, that's when we know something is off. Because God's grace really is amazing. And man, it has been the privilege of my life to get an upfront view of God's grace at work in people's lives. Like, it has been so cool to see so many people go public with their faith through baptism in the Pacific Ocean over in Ventura and to just see the way that God's grace and calls people home. You know, I think of a couple of my friends who we were standing on the side of the beach um, and I asked them, you know, what led them to make this decision? This couple that was standing there together and the guy said, well, I was a druggie and she was a drifter. We ended up together, had a few kids, and man, we want to change our ways. And they felt God's grace calling them home. I think of a kid who was standing in his pantry one day in the kitchen, listening to this music, feeling like he was isolated and alone, feeling like nobody cared, running to food once again to feel that void that he felt when all of a sudden he heard some worship music about God's amazing grace. Man, and he decided to put his faith in Jesus. I think of a girl who was adopted, who had never met her biological family, who her whole life felt this missing link, this missing hole, wasn't sure why her dad didn't want her. And then she learned that there was this heavenly father that had an amazing grace, an unfailing love for her. And man, when she decided to get baptized, it was actually the same day that she met her biological family for the very first time. But it was knowing that there was this heavenly father with an amazing grace and an unfailing love for her that changed everything. You know, I think about another couple um, who the husband had grown up going to church. The wife had never been to church before, and they had been wrestling through a bunch of questions. The wife wasn't really sure what she thought about faith, about Jesus, anything like that. And so she finally felt ready to take the next step. And she said, man, I just felt God's grace calling out to me. And then whenever we went to baptize her, she actually took her hearing aids out and was baptized in the ocean. You know, think of one of my friends who was a student with special needs and we're standing on the side of the beach um, waiting to, for him to get baptized and I just asked him, is there anything you want to say to your mom? And he just said, I love you. And man, then he accepted God's amazing grace. You know, I think of a woman who had been sober for 60 days. I think of my friend who had been in a motocross accident, who was baptized, went into the Marines, and whenever he was back um, from being overseas, man, he got to baptize his dad. His dad, who he had had a horrible relationship all growing up, but man, his dad was just won over by this amazing grace. I think about a friend of mine, a student, who came to our youth group because his mom bribed him with a pair of Yeezys. But his mom and dad divorced whenever he was young. His dad used to actually supply him with drugs. Um, He would steal money from his son, verbally abuse him all the time. But it wasn't until he knew that there was a heavenly father 
that had this amazing grace that it changed everything. You know, I think of uh, another student who was in a season of chaos. His family was about to move. He was in the middle of high school and he was always insecure and worried about his weight. But man, he just jumped right in and learned that, man, God's love, God's grace is one size fit all. And he is the only person I've ever get, seen get baptized with a cowboy hat on. You know, I think of these two twins. And um, we went to baptize them. I wasn't sure which one was which. Um, luckily, they had a name tag on. But man, these two girls, they had a dad who grew up an alcoholic. And they said, it wasn't until we had seen God's amazing grace completely change my dad's life that, man, how could we not believe? You know, I think of one of my friends who had been excommunicated from the Mormon church because he was going through a gothic phase, because he was asking some questions and it left him antagonistic to church. But man, he realized that there was a man named Jesus who had an unfailing love, amazing grace for him, and it changed everything. I think of my friend whose dad ditched him when he was in middle school and he spent his days alone and isolated in his room, feeling abandoned. I think of my friend who spent his 18th birthday in jail. I think of my friend who has struggled with suicide and self-harm. I think of my friend whose parents sent him away because he was addicted to pornography and was a womanizer, felt alone and abandoned. And it wasn't until they heard about this amazing grace, an unfailing love, that it changed everything. And man, I think of this punk, redheaded kid that was running from God when he was in high school, playing the church game, doing anything and everything to feel love. And it wasn't until I had an encounter with God's amazing grace that everything changed. Man, God's grace really is amazing. And man, maybe what you need to know today is that there is a God with an amazing grace and unfailing love who sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for your sins. You've maybe been just like Jonah, running after God, but there is a God with an amazing grace and an unfailing love that is running after you. And he has love that is so high and wide and deep and long that he would stop at nothing to pursue you. And today's just a day to do a repentance, to do an about face and to run after him. And you can do that today by just saying, God, I want to run after you. God, I want to have a relationship with you. You know, some of us, maybe we've started slipping where we were amazed by grace and we've become apathetic to grace. Maybe even angry, a little bit offended by grace. And today, man, we just need to be reminded that God's grace is for anyone and everyone and it really is amazing. I mean, Cal Church, let's continue to be the kind of place where we are amazed by God's love where we are people of grace, where anyone that comes in contact with us, man, they just cannot help but notice something different about us. And it's because we know that we have this amazing grace and unfailing love. Let's pray together. God, we just thank you. Um, God, we just thank you for loving us. God, we thank you for caring for us. God, we thank you that your grace really is amazing. And man, God, I know for so many of us uh, tuning in online today, uh, God, we, maybe it's been a long time where we've been running in the same direction. God, where we feel like we continue to hit rock bottom. God, where we continue to run after anything and everything to fill that void, to fill that hole inside of our hearts. And so God, would you just help us today, man, to do a repentance, to do an about face, to turn after you, God, and to just say, God, we need your help. God, we want to accept your grace. And God, I know for a lot of us, man, it's so easy, you know, to stop being amazed by grace, to start being offended, to be apathetic, to be angry when we see your grace extended to others. And so God, would you just help remind us that every single day, God, we need your grace, that grace is not a one and done thing, but God, this is an everyday kind of way of living. So God, that we can extend hope in life and love to anyone and everyone that we come in contact with, to anyone and everyone that walks in these doors, to God, to anyone and everyone that you put in our path. And God, we just thank you most of all for Jesus. God, and how we get to experience the life that you have to offer. We get to experience the amazing grace and unfailing love because of the sacrifice that he made on the cross. And God, it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.